How's it hanging, everybody? Today we are looking at Jeremiah chapters 41 to 43. There's a lot of strange things happening here uh, because Jeremiah kind of moves away from uh, his first person narrative about him talking about himself and events immediately around him to talking about something else kind of entirely different um, that he doesn't seem to be present for, at least not in the text. Um, and then that leads back to this section where Jeremiah talks about uh, himself and, and the remnant. So let's try to unpack all of this and ask ourselves what the heck is going on here because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty gnarly. So you may remember immediately preceding this chapter, um, Jeremiah's prophecy has come true. Uh, the prophecy that both he and all the other prophets uh, have spoken, which is uh, to the people of Judah, uh, that if you continue to rebel against God, uh, that you disobey, you worship other gods, you treat people with injustice, um, God is going to remove you from your uh, special position uh, in, this, in this land as his people, and he is going to seek justice for your disobedience. God has been given numbers of chances, hundreds of chances over hundreds of years uh, for the people to get their act together and listen, and yet they don't. And so finally, God allows uh, the Babylonian Empire to come in through King Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, he invades um, Judah and sacks the city of Jerusalem and takes a small portion of people back to Babylon and uh, wipes out most everybody else and leaves a small remnant of people behind, including Jeremiah. In these chapters, we get a picture of those people who are left behind. Uh, a guy named Gedaliah gets put in charge of, uh, as kind of governor uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, that he is kind of in charge of the few people that are, are left in the land, and uh, it's his job to sort of, sort of, yeah, redo life again as a, as a defeated people um, living in this land. But another guy named Ishmael, uh, he doesn't like this plan for whatever reason, and he comes up with this uh, scheme with the king of the Amorites, who are a neighbor to the east of Jerusalem, to basically um, put himself up as king, I guess. And so he comes in and... and during a meal, he slaughters Gedaliah and all of his uh, officials and kind of sets himself up as the guy who's going to be in charge. And then there's another scene where these people who are coming from out of town, who are coming to, um, yeah, have this religious festival, um, they meet uh, this Ishmael guy and he wipes them out, takes their stuff and throws all their bodies in this pit. It's a pretty graphic, bloody and horrible scene. Uh, so then, another guy named Joe Hannon um, realizes what's going on. He gives chase to Ishmael, and he takes back uh, the people that he had captured. He, and he um, kills most of his army, but Ishmael and uh, eight of his officers um, escape, and they go back to the east, and that, that's the last we hear from him. And then uh, these remaining people gather together, and now Jeremiah is included back into the group, and um, Johanan says to Jeremiah, can you inquire to the Lord and ask him what we should now do? Uh, it's obviously this crazy time, right? Your whole people have just more or less been wiped out. And then a few of you are remaining and one of you turns against your own people and then slaughters a bunch of those people. Uh, and now, uh, including the guy who was put in charge of the Bab by the Babylonians to be uh, the governor. And now he's gone, which means the Babylonians are not going to be happy. They might come back and invade and take us over, so we need to do something. So they asked Jeremiah to seek God's um, wisdom and discernment of what they should do. And they come up with this plan about p potentially returning back to Egypt to escape whatever sort of, um, yeah revenge that the, the Babylonian king might have on them. So Jeremiah goes and he um, talks to God and he comes back to the people and says, here's what God's word is. Stay put. If you do, um, God will 
um, help you to grow and flourish and thrive. And um, we'll make this destruction that we've just lived through something beautiful again. But if you don't listen, well, it's not going to go well for you. Then Johanan and the people, they don't really like this idea. And they say, you're lying, Jeremiah. This is not God's word. Um, and then they drag Jeremiah and his friend Baruch, um, and they head down to Egypt. And that kind of is where the, these chapters end. And we'll pick that up next week. So what's going on here? Well, this is kind of the biblical picture of uh, humanity. Um, you see this in the garden, right? All the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, God creates these people, Adam and Eve. He enters this covenant relationship with them, and he says, you can have everything, amazing blessing and prosperity, and you can thrive and grow and multiply and all of these things. I just have one condition. Don't eat the tree from this one fruit. And they don't listen, as we find out. And they eat the fruit, they rebel against God, and God says, well, now you're gonna have to face the punishment for disobeying me, to get kicked out of the garden. And you would think now, from that moment, oh, people would have learned their lesson, right? Wrong. The very next chapter, their kids, Cain and Abel, um, have a disagreement where uh, Cain gets jealous that um, God likes his brother's offering better than his, so he murders his brother. And then it spirals out of control. We see this pattern over and over again throughout Scripture, especially like the book of Judges, where the people are in, in the land, they've entered the kingdom, um, it should be theirs, and yet they constantly disobey God, they rebel, they worship foreign idols, they mistreat one another, and uh, this cycle goes on and on. God rescues them, and then makes a promise with them, and then they disobey, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And this is exactly what's happening here. These people have just uh, endured God's justice and his punishment for years and centuries of disobeying, and now it's actually happened. And now you would think, okay, the people have learned their lesson. They're going to repent and turn and listen to God. But they specifically don't. They say, God, no thank you. We're going to go back to Egypt. And Egypt is not just a physical place, obviously, but it's this place that represents the opposite. Go, putting yourself voluntarily back in slavery that God has freed you from. We're going to put ourselves back there because we think back there is better than what um, this unknown trust in, in God. And they find themselves, as we'll see, um, yeah, condemned again. So why do we do that? Why is it that instead of just trusting in God and uh, submitting ourselves and our plans to God's, that we constantly turn against him, disbelieve him, follow after other things? Well, this is the human condition. And throughout the whole Bible, you see God give people chance after chance after chance. He rescues and rescues and rescues, and yet people still don't get it because we are unable to save ourselves and break free from this pattern. Uh, and that's why Jeremiah and the whole of the Bible points to Jesus. We need someone to do for ourselves what we cannot do. That is, to break this cycle and rescue us from our stupidity and our sinfulness and our brokenness. That even when it makes total sense to trust in God, we still don't do it. And so we need help. And so as we read this crazy graphic uh, um, text of what happens here, we are reminded for our great need for Jesus to break the cycle. So may you, when you read through this, be pointed to Jesus, that he is the one who can do what we can't do for ourselves and make us right with God again and bring that prosperity and growth and, and uh, the ability to thrive once more. So trust in him. That's it. See you later. Bye.